requirement. Uh, firstly, I'd like to give thanks to God. I'm a very strong Christian to uh, making this event very possible. Uh, Honorable Maria Van Rukino, uh, Federal Member of Parliament for Kawo, and Mr. Michael Wilson, a representative from CSL, uh, the University of Melbourne for giving us this event, uh, the representative from the Zambia High Commissioner's Office, Mr. Morgan Mosa, representatives from the Australian Red Cross Blood Services, uh, representatives from the Novartis Australia, distinguished panel of speakers, and uh, the ASCA team, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Agnes. I'm the founder and the executive uh, director of Australian Super Cell Advocacy. Um, and I'm a mother of four. That's my family, um, my husband and my kids. Firstly, I would like to acknowledge the Warrunga Borders past and present who are the traditional custodians of the land on which the road children stand. Uh, it's my pleasure to be standing here today as we finally officiate our association. Uh, I would like to extend um, my appreciation again to CSL who have made it possible for my team and I to hold this event today. Um, firstly, I'd like to give, um, to begin by giving a history of why we started raising awareness about sickle cell disease. So my story started in June 2008. That's me, when I was uh, pregnant with my, my daughter, Mapalo. Um, I was in hospital and I became very unwell with a known disease. For two months, I was admitted in the King Edward Hospital for Women with symptoms similar to a sickle cell crisis. Uh, the symptoms consisted of joint pains, painful skin, sore throat, constant headache, I was jaundice, and my HP kept uh, dropping. I spent two weeks in isolation prior to getting a diagnosis of what they call Steele's disease. Adult Steele's disease is uh, defined as a rare type of inflammatory arthritis that features fevers, rash, and joint pain. Whilst in, I was in hospital, after numerous blood tests, the doctors discovered that I had the sickle cell trait. However, the hospital did not take a, uh, take a step further to test my husband to determine uh, the possibility of unborn child of developing the sickle cell disease. Follow, following the diagnosis, I was discharged on a very high dose of pregnisolin, um, along with uh, multiple vitamins. Our daughter, Mapalo, was born a healthy child. It was a healthy baby passing all initial tests at birth except that the doctors did not tell us to take our daughter back to hospital after a few months to check if she had the sickle cell disease. We didn't know that our baby had sickle cell disease until it must be manifested about 14 months old. Our diagnosis was, was only picked up um, when she had a second severe pneumonia, um, which made her second lung, uh, made her lung collapse requiring surgery for the following year at about 26 months. So after my palo's diagnosis, um, we sort of lost as a family, which prompted me um, to go and study um, at the University of Sydney. I went and did nursing. I changed my career, my career from business and did nursing uh, so that I can just find out what sickle cell was and to understand the numerous hospital visits that we started doing after my palo's diagnosis. So with Mapalo's diagnosis, she's been cared for by different teams of hospitals and uh, doctors. Um, in Perth, in Sydney, uh, and until recently here at the Royal Children's Hospital by Dr. Anthony Greenway. Um, Mapalo has gone through almost all the sickle cell disease management regimes, and until recently, she was requiring four weekly red cell exchange treatment. And thank you to the Australian Blood Services for the gift of life, and thank you for the hematology team here at the Royal Children's and other departments. Um, so, with knowing that she had the disease, we, are, we sort of didn't know what to expect. And the only way I could cope was for me to read and read and read. And that's uh, me and my husband, we uh, sort of prompted ourselves to reading and we opened the Facebook page on 26 Feb uh, April 2014, five and a half years after our daughter was diagnosed. So together with other mothers, I approached other mothers, we started a sickle cell page. In October 2008, last year, together with other parents, um, friends and clinicians, the Advocacy Association, Australian Sickle Cell Advocacy was registered. 
and uh, I stand here today as we officially launched this association. Um, I will now call upon Honorable Maria Van Kankina, our guest of honor, to officially open the event. I'll just give you a brief history of uh, Honorable Maria. She's a member of parliament uh, for Carroll, and she's the first Greek-born woman to be elected to parliament in Australia. Maria migrated to Australia with her family in 1963, and uh, as part of the Arthur Carroll Assisted Migration Policy. Maria was uh, elected federal member of parliament to the Australian Labour Party in the region of Carroll in 2001, and has been member of parliament for this electorate for seven consecutive years. Uh, she, was, uh, closely, she works closely with the community to advocate on issues such as migration, employment, health care, and education. Please welcome Maria. Thank you. Thank you, Agnes. Um, it's daunting, actually. For a parliamentarian, this is almost as big as the House Representatives Chamber, and it's green to boot. Um, can I begin by acknowledging uh, that we are on the land of Indigenous Australians, and I want to pay my respects to their elders, past and present. Thank you, Agnes, for the opportunity to be here today. I won't keep you very long, and I thought about what I could say to add value to what is happening here today. So I'll probably start with. Um, a story as well and the story firstly I'd like to say to you all that in the 18 years that I've been in Parliament we have a lot of parliamentary friendship groups and I tend to gravitate to a variety of friendship groups and many of them are in the health area uh, because it is an area that I have a great interest in from an advocacy point of view and also being able to lend a hand in promoting um, and assisting advocates when they come to Canberra to raise awareness, which ultimately also leads to uh, the need for funding of research, medical research, pharmaceuticals and all sorts of things. So um, the one group that in particular I began my parliamentary career with was the Breast Cancer Network. And I moved on to heart disease and rare diseases. And um, it's not... Uh, it's not a first for me to be involved in, certainly with the sickle cell it is, but I came to this, this hospital at the time wasn't here. The old children's hospital was uh, the place where uh, a lot of research was taking place around thalassemia. And I want to acknowledge Dr. Jim Vidalis. And also, because um, I have worked with uh, ad the advocates for thalassemia and raising awareness in all those years. And um, a very brilliant uh, doctor, the late, Panos uh, Ioannou, Dr. Ioannou, who um, had great hopes and aspirations for actually cracking, as he used to say, the code to thalassemia and other, and other um, blood disorders. So I'm very pleased to have uh, met Agnes. I met Agnes a number of years ago. I didn't realise she was my constituent until she walked into my office uh, some months ago and asked for uh, assistance in setting this group up. So I wasn't going to hesitate at all. In fact, I was very enthusiastic about uh, assisting her and uh, here we are today and I'm very pleased to be here to actually participate in the launch of this very important uh, advocacy group. Um, I'm also very pleased because it's a bit of a family affair in terms of my electorate because um, Mapalo goes to the Good Samaritan Primary School that I have a very good relationship with for a whole series of other issues and they're here today. And I'm also pleased that CSL which is an iconic institution in the federal city of Cornwall, uh, down in Broadmeadows, is sponsoring this event. So I I'm going to call it a bit of a family affair, and I'm very proud to be involved in that as such. Uh, a few words about the importance of advocacy for any, any, any conditions, and in particular rare diseases such as this. Uh, unless the community is aware, um, it's possible that people will be living with um, conditions that uh, they may not be aware of, and I think, Agnes, that's what you know, your, your own personal experience brought you into the realm of sickle cell disease. Um, the influx or the, the, the changing nature of our migration patterns are important because in, in, in the last 20 years or so, in particular, we've received lots of new Australians um, from African countries. And, and so it is that there are conditions that perhaps are not uh, exclusively for people from a particular place, but they generally tend to be 
associated with people from parts of the world come to Australia, become Australians, have conditions that perhaps we don't know about or don't know enough about. So it's very important that we uh, begin a process of learning, of raising awareness, and ultimately uh, you will probably all come to Canberra one day and seek financial assistance or funding for whatever research needs to be done. That's the, the way it all goes, and I'd be very pleased to receive you and assist you in that process. I think what is happening here today, um, when Agnes, um, when I asked Agnes, actually I did ask Agnes when I saw her, well, how many people in Cornwall would have this this condition? And she said, well, we, we wouldn't know because there's no register, there's nowhere to actually uh, keep track of who who has sickle cell disease. So that's one of your aims. Uh, your One of your aims is to collect that very important data. Um, I'm not a scientist or a medical practitioner, but data, I'm a politician and data is just as important to, to politicians as it is to, to scientists and medical profession because that's how we learn and track our learnings and do further research and hopefully find um, cures and responses to dealing with conditions. So I'm very pleased to be associated with um, the Sickle Cell Foundation. I intend to continue to work with you, Agnes, and with Preston. Both of you have done a great job in bringing this together. We always have to be mindful that people who drive these advocacy organisations do it um, voluntarily. They do it out of commitment. Um, in Agnes's case, they have a young child that you, I mean, the fact that you took up nursing, Agnes, in order to understand and be a better, you know, better help your child is an incredible testament. It's, it's, um, it's just amazing that you would go to those lengths in order to be able to manage something that is a, that is a family issue because you deal with it as, as a family. And the fact that you are now driving this um, advocacy group to help everyone else um, is, is commendable. And I'm never, I never cease to be amazed the amount of people that I have met over the years who have been involved in advocacy groups in order to uh, assist the, 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 the collective and for the greater good. And I think that as, as a member of parliament, um, I always say to people who want to come to see me or who do come to see me about advocating on issues, that we rely on the strength of that advocacy to get things done. So I expect that this, um, this organisation, this, this group will do a lot of work into the future and will be of assistance to the good doctors that we have here and scientists at the Royal Children's Hospital. Um, to help them as well in the research that they need to do in order to help the community. So I'm very pleased to be uh, associated with you. I wish you all the very best of luck. If I've got to say those magical words, um, is this an officially opening, official launch? Do we cut a ribbon? <laughs> Whatever it is that we need to do, congratulations to you all. I look forward to working with you and the very best of luck as you will continue to build on the medical and scientific excellence that this country is famed for. And I know that for a fact because I've worked in that area as a politician. Australian doctors, Australian scientists are always at the cutting edge. Uh, blue sky research, for whatever reason, we, and I'm told by everyone, punch way above our weight. Um, and I'm very proud that we live in a country that has the intellectual capacity, but also the support from its community and from government and from the uh, private sector to do work that is not only of benefit to Australians but also to the global community. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. A big hand for Before I call upon the experts to uh, explain what sickle cell is, I'll just give you a, a brief um, um, maybe history of why we started uh, the advocacy from the, the beginning. So why um, uh, Australian sickle cell advocacy, ASCA for short, for short and uh, what we want to achieve? Well, here are our main objectives um, to begin with. Um, we formed this advocacy group uh, to fill the gap of the highlighting rising numbers of sickle cell disease 
we know um, from the data that we have and the, the friends that we have interested, I've got a lot of friends, we realize that there's no place that we can, we can go to in terms of support. And uh, uh, even though there's other uh, blood disorders um, support groups, well, as a parent myself, there's uh, that part that I, I miss um, to talk to somebody who was speaking the same language. So our, our aim, our association is um, our main mission to be the leading advocacy for people affected by sickle cell um, in Australia. Um, sickle cell disease has been around for over 100 years, but was only recognized as a public health um, problem by the World Health Organization in 2008. The experts that are here at this hospital uh, state that sickle cell prevalence in Australia has increased tenfold in the past 15 years. And currently we don't have a conclusive uh, uh, prevalence data, as uh, Honorable Maria said, uh, due to the limitation being faced by the hemoglobinopathy registry that's being run by the Monash University. So they collect data uh, on the prevalence of blood disorders, uh, sickle cell control. So by knowing the prevalence in Australia, we'll have a better understanding of the number of uh, people that we need to support as an association. Uh, we also have statistics to, uh, to present to funding bodies and research scientists to encourage continued work and investment in this area. Hence, our immediate objective is to work with the public health um, preventative medicine who are doing the immobilopathy uh, registry and, uh, so that we can see how we can help and to avoid the limitation that they are currently being faced. Um, furthermore, there is no uh, uh, there's no, currently there's no pharmaceutical cure for sickle cell disease uh, and so we would like therefore to see more research, Dr. Vodalas, um, are conducted towards other funding um, so that we can have other uh, curative options for sickle cell disease uh, rather than merely managing the symptoms. Currently the only known cure for sickle cell disease is a bone marrow transplant but the bone marrow transplant comes with a lot of barriers, including uh, lack of suitable donors, uh, transplant rejection, and long-term side effects. Currently, sickle cell disease is still uh, considered as a rare disease in Australia, and as a result, there's no funding specifically for conditions thereby severely limiting, uh, limiting research towards finding a cure here in Australia. The International Sickle Cell Day Awareness Day today, uh, 19th uh, June, we as ASCA are urging research scientists in Australia to shine a light on sickle cell disease. ASCA is urging, uh, urging scientists to look at a better, uh, brighter picture and not limit the independent, um, intended impact on the Australian patient. Our association would also like to see that there is a standardized approach of caring for sickle cell disease patients in Australia. Currently, we don't have any national guidelines and we just rely on uh, guidelines from uh, overseas. Hence, we are going to work with relevant authorities um, to ensure Australia has its own national sickle cell guidelines and not only rely on international guidelines. We have cases where each hospital does its own way of uh, uh, treating sickle cell patients or whether or not at-risk mothers are uh, tested during pregnancy. I can gladly say that after the experience I'd had at the King Edwards, even if they didn't test me, King Edwards Hospital has since introduced prenatal testing for sickle cell disease for all mothers coming from at risk countries. Hence, another national objective uh, for us um, is for us to see that all hospitals are testing mothers from at risk countries. Uh, just to see, I'll give you an example that a friend of mine who had two children before was told that their baby age 10 months old had sickle cell disease. She was tested during the first two pregnancies, but was only tested for um, sickle cell at the third pregnancy after her HP started dropping. Due to having no national guidelines, I have to rely, sorry, I have to rely on seeing the hematologists are trained in sickle cell disease from New South Wales. There's also a miscommunication of their pediatrician and the general practitioner the pediatrician would like to, uh, the baby to have extra vaccines. However, the GP has said they have to wait until the baby is one year old. It's examples like this that makes it very critical that we have national sickle cell guidelines and such, such confusions will be avoided. By the way, our friends have to wait until November to see the hematologist um, 
because there's no hematologists that are trained to do that um, in the state that they reside in. So um, as a sickle cell uh, patient advocacy association, we would also like want to connect uh, to the affected people with sickle cell. We intend to do this by holding support and network workshops. We are asking the main hospitals, uh, treating hospitals and these uh, treating patients to work with us to engage with the affected people. We'd also like to continue raising um, awareness by holding educational workshops for people who may be at risk of having this condition. We intend to do this by holding, um, working with different multicultural communities and events. We'd also like to work with different hospitals and GPs to identify people at risk and how we can uh, reach out. The other area that we are trying to, uh, going to introduce is having a body, body program between different age groups. We intend to work with different hospitals, parents and carers and uh, ASCA representatives to body patients in different age groups for younger patients to have someone to, to connect with under our supervision. This program would be very essential to kids living or graduating from hospitals, uh, children's hospitals and moving into adult hospitals. We'll also be holding fundraising events during the years and direct funds uh, raised towards sickle cell projects or sickle cell research. So, um, how can you help? We, we can't do this alone, so we are asking your help, and one way you can help is uh, by becoming a member. Our membership is free, uh, for now. If you haven't done so already, please sign up whilst it's still free. Uh, you can join by volunteering in different projects. One area we've been doing uh, for the past five years, um, before even having the, registered, uh, having the association registered, we've been volunteering for Run for the Kids for the past five years. Uh, this year, we'll also be taking part in Run Melbourne and we'll be supporting the Peter Mac um, uh, Cancer Centre. You can also become a fundraiser, hold funding, uh, fundraising events on our behalf to support our cause. You can also partner with us, uh, become a blood donor. One of the most successful sickle cell management is by having routine blood tests. Uh, please talk to the blood services representatives here after the event and see how you can become a blood donor. So that's, that's said about our association and where we go, but I'll just quickly go back and uh, talk about my daughter. So where, where are we in terms of Apollo's treatment? So this year, on 21st February, our daughter had a bone marrow transplant. Fortunately uh, for us, we are in the minority few who have uh, the sibling donor. Our third child was a donor for Mapalo. She had a transplant on 21st February. Uh, Mapalo's treatment was very smooth, and today she is 118 days post bone marrow transplant. We'd like to say thank you to Dr. Anthea Greenway, who has been treating Mapalo uh, since 2013. Um, before we were transferred to doctor to oncology team, now with uh, Dr. Dave Hughes, I uh, would like to say thank you to Dr. Francois, who's uh, left the hospital, but has been a very huge uh, impact on our family. We are, since 2013, we are discussing with her how we can have the bone marrow transplant. Um, a big thank you to Dr. Hughes, who's taken over from uh, Dr. Francois, and all other doctors still treating Mapalo as she continues her, her treatment post bone marrow transplant. I also want to say a big thank you to Sally Anderson and our Kookaburra nursing staff for a smooth hospital stay in Kookaburra Ward for over 40 days. So um, even though Mapalo's treatment was very smooth, the only part that made her really upset, she cried about this, is losing her hair. That was the only part. She would vomit and do everything else, but losing her hair was the worst. So I volunteered and we cut our hair together. Uh, and we bought wigs together. <laughs> and so that's where we are with Mapalo and uh, our treatment is going very well. Before I go, uh, you may have seen that uh, we have water. It's not in summer, but you have noticed that we have water as one of our uh, things in the bag. 
So, well, the good reason for this is that water is the number one sickle cell therapy um, when you're having a sickle cell management. So, um, I want you to, to, when you leave this place, when you go home, um, when you are having a glass of water, when you are bathing, when you are cooking, when you are washing, think of a sickle cell patient. Because for us, for them, this is the number one management. When you're at home, the first thing Dr. Green will tell me is for her to have hydration. When you come to hospital, you have hydration. Think of uh, those affected when you have a drink of water. And so this International Sickle Cell Day, I'd like to say a huge thank you to you all for coming to support us and sincerely ask that to help ask her to raise our voices so that we can change the, the face of sickle cell disease in Australia. Um, and before I, I finish, I'd like to share the proud moment of, for our daughter's treatment. When Mapalo was discharged from the transplant unit, uh, we can safely confirm that Mapalo is, uh, who's now 10 years old, nine months, 18 days, is cured from sickle cell disease. about other people that couldn't make it. <coughs> and one of the hardest <coughs> things that uh, stopped us to do the bone marrow transplant for our daughter was because of that girl. Her name was Natasia Rachel Nakazwe. Um, she had sickle cell disease. She was a sister, she loved me so much. I, I was her partner at her grade seven graduation. Um, she was very bubbly. She would talk all the time. I've got the brother-in-law here uh, on my, do you understand? I packed her bags when she went to hospital. And she died because she had complications due to the bone marrow transplant trying to cure the sickle cell disease. And that's why we are asking for research scientists to do something and not just rely on bone marrow transplants as a cure so that we don't lose life. Like she was in yes, uh, 12 when she died. We miss you, Tizia, and forever in our hearts. upon Dr. Anthony Greenway. Um, I'll just give you a short history of Dr. Greenway. Dr. Greenway is a pediatric hematologist here at the Royal Children's Hospital and Monash Centre in Melbourne. She's the clinical lead uh, for sickle cell and uh, hemoglobin services, the clinical lead of the Ephoresis services and chair of the Ephoresis committee at the Royal Children's Hospital. Dr. Greenway. Thank you very much, Agnes, and I'd like to also personally congratulate the committee on a fantastic day today. This is a testament to all your fantastic hard work. So I've, my introduction's been done. The other thing I'd say is I was very fortunate to spend two years at a sickle cell centre in the US, so the Sickle Cell Centre at Duke University Medical Centre, 
which is one of 10 centres for excellence in the US. And so I think this is one of our other initiatives is to make sure we're sending clinicians to some of the other places around the world to learn about treating sickle cell disease, and it's really important. So my job for the next 10 minutes is really just to set the scene for our panel discussion and just to make sure that we're all together in our awareness about what sickle cell disease is. So it's a single change in the genetic code for haemoglobin and it wreaks havoc throughout the body, unfortunately. The problem is it turns our red blood cells, which carry our oxygen around the body, from these nice healthy red cells you see on the left to sickle cells on the right. And as many of my smaller patients will know, I call these cells bent bananas. And what happens during a sickle cell crisis, it's a bit like shoving a bunch of bananas in a water pipe. And that stops the blood getting around the body and makes the oxygen levels drop and causes damage to the tissues throughout the body. So that's what happens when we have a sickle cell crisis. And it causes a number of problems throughout the body, both acute complications, but also chronic complications that you'll see here. It's a really exciting time for sickle cell disease at the moment because we have a marked improvement in our knowledge of what causes problems in sickle cell. And so we now know that beyond the red blood cell problem, there are lots of other uh, systems in the body that are involved in sickle cell disease. So we know a number of these uh, other cells you'll see down the bottom, so white blood cells, platelets, and lots of other chemicals in the body also mediate the terrible tissue damage that we can see during a sickle cell crisis. This sort of information is really important and has completely changed the landscape because now we've got lots of other targets and other things to focus on in trying to help patients with sickle cell disease. So how big is this problem? It is a global health problem. The frequency of uh, um, mutations in the haemoglobin gene throughout the whole population is between 1 to 5 per cent. So that means many of us uh, have problems with these genes that results in problems such as sickle cell disease, as we've heard. We know that now there's patients with sickle cell disease throughout the world. We're a very mobile population and we all live in lots of different places. And so sickle cell previously was really located in just a, number, a small number of countries and it's now seen throughout the world. But one of the problems we have with sickle cell disease is 90% of patients who are affected are in low and middle income countries. And that really can cause a problem in terms of having access or opportunity to do lots of research. So where are we now? So a recent study published in 2015, you'll see that Australia is actually finally on the map in terms of um, being sort of acknowledged for having a reasonably large sickle cell population. But as I've mentioned, most patients with sickle cell disease live in sub-Saharan Africa, um, Indian subcontinent, and also in North America. So we've uh, already heard a little bit about the Hemoglobinopathy Registry, which has been run out of uh, Transfusion Outcomes Research Collaborative at Monash University and with the Australian Red Cross Blood Service. And this really started back in the mid-2000s, where uh, Australian Paediatric Surveillance Unit started to capture data on new patients diagnosed with sickle cell disease, and that's really now been expanded to include both adult and paediatric patients. For the current registry, we have 381 patients on the registry, 13 sites involved, eight of which are actively recruiting. And the number of patients on the registry is 128 who identify as having sickle cell disease. These numbers are increasing, however, and I think in reality, this is really um, the tip of the iceberg in terms of how much sickle disease we're, disease we're seeing in Australia. So we're very fortunate in Australia to have excellent medical care, as we've heard, and really my experience in the US, I came home so grateful for the opportunity to work in fantastic public health that we have in Australia. We have access to all of the therapies that we see that are used throughout the world to treat sickle cell disease. A number of them are listed here, and I'll just walk you through some of these, um, some of these treatments. As Agnes has alluded to, there's very good consensus and evidence-based guidelines now on how we treat sickle cell disease. We can make good decisions in terms of what we can offer to our patients. Many of these are out of the US, but also some of the European countries. This is the most recent version in 2014 from a large group in the US, but now we have similar guidelines throughout Europe, but no local guidelines in Australia. And these are regularly updated, so a new version is due at the end of this year. Really, even in my career, hydroxyurea is a medication that has completely revolutionised the treatment of sickle cell disease. This is a medication that we know reduces the amount of those sickle cells that I showed you at the start, but also targets many of the other aspects of sickle cell disease that I mentioned, so the white blood cells, some of the chemicals that cause the inflammation and the tissue damage. 
We have lots of evidence now that, that hydroxyurea works really well for patients with sickle cell disease. And this evidence is both in adult patients, but also paediatric, and you'll see from some of the names there, baby hugs. That's a study done in babies down to eight months of age. And we really, patients now born with sickle cell disease will have a very different experience um, because of medications such as hydroxyurea. Another big part of my job is to make sure I'm looking after my patients with screening and prevention strategies to really reduce the complications that we see from sickle cell disease. And this is really important things like preventing life-threatening infections with vaccinations and antibiotics, but making sure I'm looking after things like kidney disease, lung disease, blood pressure and eyes, as well as some of the more dreaded complications such as stroke. So this is a really important part of clinicians knowing, as Agnes has mentioned, what are the things that they need to be looking out for and how do they know sort of how to monitor patients with sickle cell. As we've already heard, blood transfusion is an essential part of treatment for sickle cell disease for many patients and it's certainly of great benefit to many of our population. The problem is that this comes with some risks and these can be related to things like too much iron in the blood, causing iron overload, but also the risks of infection. And also some of the problems we see where we, there is genetic variation or difference between our blood donors and the population of patients who need to receive blood regularly. There's been incredible advances in transfusion medicine science as well in the last few years and this is really a fantastic benefit again for patients with sickle cell and other hemoglobinopathies. Again, our evidence base for when we need to use transfusion in sickle cell disease has also significantly improved over this time period. So as we've heard a little bit about, red cell exchange is really a very specific transfusion treatment that we use for sickle cell disease and really even our access to this treatment has vastly improved in Australia. It's a process where you'll see the patient is actually hooked up to a machine, which, which is called an apheresis machine. It has a big um, centrifuge in it, which spins the blood really fast and allows us to separate the different layers of the blood and to take the sickle cells out of the patient and put new blood cells into the patient. And so that's a, a therapy that's um, growing increasingly in sickle cell but many other diseases as well. Again, our evidence base for using this treatment is now much stronger than it ever has been in terms of a number of studies that have really helped us to work out which patients will benefit the most from this treatment. But what's new in sickle cell disease care? As I mentioned, it's a, an exciting time for patients and clinicians. There's more than 200 active recruiting trials around the world at the moment, and 70 of these are in what we call phase three. So in medical terms, this is the phase just before these treatments really reach the clinical coal phase where we can offer them to patients. Quite a number of these trials are related to bone marrow transplant and gene therapy, but a number of them relate to medications that will be, I can see will become available in the next couple of years. So many of our new drugs are going to target some of those things I mentioned at the start, the white blood cells, the chemicals, the inflammation, blood clots that we see in sickle cell disease and breakdown of red blood cells, all of really um, which can exacerbate the clinical um, condition for the patient. For the researchers in the audience, this is really a summary table of where all these drugs are up to. And you can see there's lots of different targets that we're seeing on the left. And these are all the drugs we're using and these are the different phases that they're in. So you can see this is a very exciting slide for a clinician who can look ahead and say, well, what am I going to have in my toolbox to offer patients that I see with conditions such as sickle cell? Where do I think this is going? So I think in reality what we're going to need is a multi-targeted approach. So for patients who um, don't need uh, transfusion or are not at the point of needing a bone marrow transplant, using different, a different cocktail of medications to try and control their disease will be really important. Thinking about transplants, we've already heard from Agnes about transplant. This is the only therapy we have currently that allows you to cure sickle cell disease. But one of the biggest problems is less than 20% of patients will have an appropriate brother or sister or sibling bone marrow don um, donor. So therefore we're not able to offer this to all patients unfortunately. It is a risky procedure, so it's always a situation where we're having to balance some significant acute risks versus some long term versus significant long term benefits. Uh, this is a, a current summary slide of where all the bone marrow transplant research is up to. So you'll see there's lots of activity in that space as well. And what you'll see at the top is that now we have many thousands of patients with sickle cell disease who've undergone bone marrow transplant. And that really allows us as clinicians to um, uh, you know, become very um, 
aware and, and to sort of improve protocols so that we get the best outcome for patients. But most of the bottom studies are actually looking at different ways to do transplant where we might be able to expand who we can offer the transplant to beyond the 20% who have a match. So gene therapy, many of you in, um, who keep up with the popular media will see gene therapy is also a very hot topic in sickle cell and thalassemia. Uh, and Australia's been at the forefront of this with one of the thalassemia patients in Sydney being involved in the very original um, gene therapy trials in beta thalassemia. So we're up to about 20 patients with sickle cell disease having gene therapy in centres particularly in France and um, three centres in the US that are looking at this therapy. But I think this is just really the start of ongoing development that will really offer another alternative cure for sickle cell disease beyond uh, bone marrow transplant. So just to finish, what are some of our local challenges in Australia? One of the issues we have is our patients come from all over the world. So unlike some of the populations overseas that all come from the same place, we have a, a sort of very ethnically diverse population. That affects how patients present, but also some of the complications that they may have. So it adds sort of challenges as clinicians in terms of what we need to be aware of. It also has implications for safe blood transfusion. As we know, as we've already heard um, this morning, without good statistics and data on the epidemiology of sickle cell disease, that also makes us very hard to plan how many doctors will we need to look after sickle cell disease, we need to train nurses, how do we sort of factor that in in terms of where we're heading. So that information will be really important. As we've also heard from Agnes, without um, newborn screening, many patients with sickle cell disease in Australia actually present in middle childhood. They're not found till much later. And that means they're often presenting with complications and not getting the treatment they need from very early on in life. Transition of care, where patients move from paediatric services to adults, is often a very challenging time for families, and we certainly have some models here in Australia, but internationally this is often a time of significant stress for patients with sickle cell disease, and it's something that we will have to work on as clinicians um, and as a community in terms of caring for patients and families with sickle cell. So where do I see the future in sickle cell disease? Improved transfusion practice thinking about new medications that will help us to look after patients, and then things like bone marrow, um, bone marrow transplant and gene therapy are our future. But where to from here? Echoing many of the messages we've already heard, advocacy is really important. So this is a rare disease, but it has significant impact for patients in terms of quality of life. And so access to healthcare um, and uh, pathway development is really important. So a number of the clinicians involved in sickle cell care in the room and I'd like to thank them for their ongoing support in terms of um, obtaining the skills we need to really make sure we look after patients well. But awareness in primary care, so teaching GPs, medical students, nursing students, emergency departments, paediatricians, physicians, teaching the whole medical community about sickle cell disease is really important. We need local champions both in the community but also in our hospitals to make sure that there's a good awareness that um, you know, of the, of the uh, therapies I've discussed and how to really look after patients with sickle cell. And promotion in terms of blood donation and community awareness is really important So, um, to make sure that we're doing everything we can to support patients and families. So the clinician, patient and advocacy group partnership is really important, I think, in all of these steps. And so I'm thrilled to be part of the association and to continue to work with you as we move into the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Greenway. So, my name's Sarah Chagenza and I currently serve on the board for ASA and as a scientific advisor. Um, and we're now gonna move into a panel session. So Dr. Greenway um, will be serving on our panel, so I'll invite her to take a seat wherever you like. Thank you very much. Um, and I'm gonna now invite up the five other panel members we have on our agenda. So, sorry, um, Miss Claire Dowsing, um, Associate Professor Nairi Elwood, Mr. Peter Leos, Mr. Robin Visakabadetti, and Preston Musoka. So in the interest of time, um, how we're gonna let this run, we want to give each of the panel members an opportunity to introduce themselves for those who haven't spoken yet. Um, and then we'd also like to open up the floor to any questions the audience members have. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, give a brief 10 minutes or less, if we can accomplish that, um, for each of the panel members to give a brief introduction of themselves in terms of how they're linked to sickle cell disease. So I'll hand it over to Robin first, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Thank you. Sorry, Doc. Sorry, Dr. Sarah, it's early in the morning. So good morning, everyone. Um, it won't take 10 minutes, it might take a minute for me. Um, I'm Robin, I have thalassemia minor. Uh, my wife, Georgia, she's got sickle thalassemia and uh, I have a daughter who's got thal major. Um, my daughter gets transfused regularly, whereas my wife cannot be transfused at all because she's got a complication in sickle cell or sickle thalassemia. So uh, that's a complicated situation as it is. Um, but today it's given me good hope. Uh, congratulations, Agnes, on Mapalo's uh, awesome recovery. That's, that's fantastic stuff. So it's giving me a hope into the future. So groups like these really help me. So I try to associate myself with any of the groups out there. So, um, yeah, I work nine to five, a uh, regular worker, um, but I try to keep myself abreast with anything that goes on because it is a long road for anyone with, uh, with one of these conditions, uh, thalassemia or sickle cell. And um, it takes time, it takes effort to go through it. And uh, thank you. Thanks very much, Robert. And now I'm going to pass on to Preston, who's the co-founder of ASA. Uh, morning, everybody. Um, my name is Preston, a software husband to Agnes. And I'm thrilled to have all you, all you people here. Well, it's nice to have people coming to support us um, in this cause. And congratulations with that for doing it. It's been amazing. Thank you for all the hard work while I'm away. And yeah, it's been amazing. Thank you, everybody. Cheers. Hi, I'm Nairi Elwood. I'm the director of the Cord Blood Bank here at the Children's Hospital. So our Cord Blood Bank is one of three public Cord Blood Banks in Australia, the others being in Sydney and Queensland. And we're government funded to collect cord blood from mums who altruistically donate their cord blood to the, the bank. We employ our own midwives at, um, who are specially trained to recruit mums and um, do all the paperwork and the family history, collect the cord blood, and then it is brought here in Melbourne to um, our processing laboratory where it's processed and <coughs> stored and is then, um, it undergoes a lot of testing and is then available for anyone around the world who needs a bone marrow transplant um, for all sorts of um, illnesses, in, in particular leukaemia, but, but other blood disorders. So within the three Oscord cord blood banks, we have 38,000 cord blood units in our registry, and we have released um, just on 1,300 cord blood units for patients um, in Australia and around the world. And I did do a, a bit of a look back before today's fabulous um, launch. And so far, we have not released any cord blood units for cord blood transplants for sickle cell disease. And um, then following up with the Australian Bone Marrow Transplant Recipient Registry, they have actually released um, four bone marrow, or undergone four bone marrow transplants, and all of those have been in sibling donors, um, where the best results, as, as you've already heard, um, the best outcome at the moment for patients undergoing bone marrow transplant for sickle cell disease is with sibling donors. Um, but I, I guess one of the other things that we do and increasingly, we're, we're seeing more um, African donors coming to our, one of our collection sites here in Melbourne. And um, one of the great things we do is we actually do test for haemoglobinopathy testing for, for every um, cord blood donor or every baby that, that comes into our bank. And occasionally we do pick up <coughs> um, abnormalities that way, which I think um, in lieu of you know, regular screening, that that's quite a valuable service that we provide to 
Unfortunately, we can't collect from every hospital around Melbourne um, due to our government fund funding model and, um, and infrastructure. But um, hopefully that gives you a little bit of an insight into what we do have here, here in Australia and is serving a valuable purpose. So, thanks. Hi, my name is Claire Dowsing. I'm a registered nurse at the Royal Melbourne Hospital. Um, I'd just like to thank Agnes for inviting me to participate in this momentous occasion. And so good to see so many people attending. So well done, everyone. Um, my background is in haematology and blood transfusion. And I came over to Australia from New Zealand in 2002 uh, to run the apheresis unit at the Royal Melbourne Hospital and what was a fledgling red cell exchange program at that time. I don't know if you noticed, but on the map that Anthea showed, New Zealand didn't even feature. <laughs> so that was my first introduction to patients with sickle cell disease. Um, at that time, we had five patients on red cell exchange, and we now have over 30 patients who attend regularly for um, blood transfusion, which is made possible through blood donors and through the Australian Red Cross Blood Service. Uh, this has been a really fantastic treatment option. Uh, it isn't curative, but it does help to ameliorate the adverse effects that can occur with sickle cell and often occur with sickle cell disease. So with that said, I'm going to pass over to my dear friend Peter to talk about his experience. Thanks, Claire. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I might just take a tad more time to read through this. Um, uh, my name's Peter Leos. Uh, I was born on the 13th of May in 1960 in Melbourne, uh, Australia here, to Greek immigrant parents. Uh, I studied at Monash University, uh, got a Bachelor of Economics uh, and a Diploma in Education at the University of Melbourne and I became a school teacher. Uh, I've been teaching full time since 1983 and at Laidlaw Secondary College since 1984. Uh, I was diagnosed with sickle cell anemia in 1963 uh, when I was three years old. My first awareness of sickle cell pain was pain in the joints uh, of my fingers as a three year old. This developed into more severe joint pain as I got older and became a teenager, usually in the arms or legs, uh, and in later years in the lower back. Uh, for 50 years, the standard treatment uh, was pain relief, blood transfusions, and staying hydrated. The symptoms of sickle cell pain and the anemia were treated in this way, uh, but there was no preventative treatment at the time, <coughs> other than avoiding dehydration, overexertion, or infections, which were the triggers uh, of a crisis. Uh, but then often you had a, a painful crisis for no apparent reason. Uh, I had weekly or fortnightly appointments at the Haemodology Clinic at the Royal Children's Hospital, the, the old building, uh, where a blood test and my haemoglobin level would determine if I went home after the appointment uh, or whether I was admitted into the hospital for a transfusion. I dreaded those appointments. Um, here I was looked after by great haematologists like Dr John Colbatch, uh, Dr Henry Eckert, to name a few. Um, the Royal Children's Hospital was a site of a lot of pain and loneliness for me, and yet at the same time I had very fond memories of this place. In 1978, when I was 18, <coughs> I was transferred across to the Royal Melbourne Hospital and was looked after by Dr John Sullivan. Uh, at first this was done at the hospital, and then I saw Dr John Sullivan privately until he passed away in 2010. Uh, during this time I became dependent on the painkillers that were required to relieve my pain. Throughout this period at the Royal Children's Hospital and the Royal Melbourne Hospital, there were other patients with thalassemia and leukaemia, uh, but never anyone with sickle cell anemia. Uh, I didn't have the opportunity to talk to anyone about sickle cell anemia uh, until uh, much later in life. Uh, sickle cell anemia was a rare condition in Melbourne. Uh, few people in the 60s and, uh, and the 70s um, had the knowledge or the experience uh, in Melbourne to treat sickle cell anemia or even to effectively manage chronic pain. In 2011, I was referred to uh, Dr. Annabelle Tuckfield and began apheresis uh, treatment, the red cell exchange treatment. This treatment for me was life changing. Uh, I've not had a sickle cell crisis since December 2010. And as a result of this, <coughs> I was weaned off the pain medication throughout the latter part of 2011 and by January 2012 was no longer dependent on this medication. Uh, the apheresis treatment freed me from the many limitations that my condition had imposed upon me. I've been able to continue working as a school teacher, this year celebrating my 35th year at the same school and 36 years teaching overall. I've been able to travel to Europe uh, twice in the last few years and able to enjoy being 
uh, in the water at the beach or at a swimming pool for the first time since 1977 without the temperature change resulting in severe sickle cell bone pain. Uh, a few years ago while at work at Laylor Secondary College, I met a student who had sickle cell anemia. And for the first time in my life, I was able to share some of my experiences with someone who knows what it feels like. Uh, at 53, that was my first time, or the first time that I spoke to another person, another sufferer of sickle cell anemia. Uh, she has since graduated from high school, got married, and is benefiting from the apheresis treatment uh, with Claire, uh, like I am. Um, and in closing, uh, I just wanted to say one more thing. One of the most important things that I wanted growing up uh, and didn't have was information. Information is hope. Information about the disease, what's likely to happen in the future, uh, will I be able to hold down a job or a long-term relationship or have kids? These were the sort of questions that I thought about and I wish uh, I could tell my 15-year-old self that you know, things are going to be okay. Uh, I wanted information from doctors who had actually uh, looked after patients like me and information from patients who were talking, uh, sorry, who were walking the same path uh, as I was and could share their experiences. Uh, this sickle cell advocacy group and the work that Agnes has done uh, provides that sort of information uh, that was lacking when I was growing up. So of course this group has my wholehearted support and I hope it has yours. Thank you. Thanks very much Peter and thank you to all the panel members we have here. Now I'd like you all to think of some questions. I'm going to introduce two more members but while I do so please think of your questions. <laughs> We've also got a Facebook Live page, um, so you can see our Facebook um, handle here. So if you're shy about asking questions, please ask it through our Facebook Live page by logging on there with your devices. And the two other members I'd like to introduce who are also experts in our audience today are Miss Anita Gorry, who's an Associate Genetic Counselor from Monash Health. Um, and I'm just inviting her to introduce herself um, and potentially talk a bit about pregnancy testing and the current status of testing. <coughs> sickle cell disease. Sorry, can, oh, there we go, great, fantastic. Thanks, Amina. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so I'm a genetic counsellor at Monash Hospital um, and um, one of my main roles is working with um, pregnant patients or people planning a pregnancy who are at risk of thalassemia or sickle cell disease. We do a lot of screening for all of our patients there. Um, yeah, and talking to them about their options during a pregnancy or pre-pregnancy or post-pregnancy. Fantastic, thanks Anita. So, <laughs> so feel free to ask any questions as well directed to Anita. And the last person I'd like to, like to acknowledge from the audience is Dr. Luke Gahan, who's a research fellow with the Blood Services Unit um, who are always keen to look at new donors um, in relation to treatments for sickle cell disease. So, um, sorry, Luke, fantastic, thank you. Hi everyone, and congratulations on your launch today. Uh, at the, um, as you will have heard today, uh, blood transfusion is one of the most important methods for treating sickle cell. Um, and as the, um, just like with bone marrow, uh, people who receive transfusions for both thalassemia and sickle cell often end up requiring blood that's closely matched to their own. Um, and that's increasingly becoming an issue as we diversify our population, as you've heard today, we need to start diversifying the people who actually donate blood to the blood service. Um, so th there's a number of research projects at the blood service looking at diversifying um, our donor panel. Um, but I guess our most important message today is, is if you have family members who are able to donate, um, or yourself, oh, well, we'd love to see you at the blood service and we've got some information out there today too to help you sign up to donate blood. And when you donate blood, you can also register for the bone marrow registry as well. Great, thank you very much, Luke. So I'd now like to open the floor up to questions. So if anyone would like to start us off, if you just raise your hand and I shall come find you and try and direct your question to the most relevant panel member. Fantastic, thank you.
Hi everyone, um, welcome to the panel, thank you. Um, Agnes, congratulations on today and congratulations to the um, sickle cell community in Victoria. As one of um, the very mature um, adults with um, beta thalassemia major in Victoria, I can attest that there is a long, long history um, to haemoglobinopathy in this state and in Australia. And one of the things that just comes back to me time and time again is that the awareness and the understanding of our haemoglobinopathies follows Australia's immigration patterns. So having been born in the early 1970s, not long after Theo, uh, we had a wave of haemoglobinopathy being identified in Victoria and in Australia. And today, uh, 40, 50 years on, that wave is continuing and there's a second stage to it. I would like to um, uh, provide some acknowledgement of that and that in 50 years, we still haven't had sufficient research and studies on the correlation between Australia's immigration and, um, and these conditions coming up in our community. But attached to that, we still haven't got effective carrier screening programs. And carrier screening programs are really the beginning and the end of our, a lot of this because we can control uh, what is happening in the community in terms of family planning with carrier screening. So that's something that in my lifetime I would like to see as a serious contemplation um, in, in this whole um, sector in relation to haemoglobinopathy. Also, I'd like to point out that the provision of um, treatments, therapies, access and equity has not occurred in Australia without the work of people like Agnes, but 50 and, uh, and more years ago of people like Theo's parents and my parents that fought for basic transfusion medicine and then some uh, iron chelation therapies. So desferoxamine, which is as good as a cure 50 years ago, did not exist in, our, this, in this country without the lobbying of um, mums and dads selling fruitcakes in the front of the Royal Children's Hospital. Also, apheresis exchange was a pipe dream in Australia, um, even 15 years ago. And the apheresis machine out at Monash Southern Health Medical Centre, which is managed by Caroline over here very well, uh, was only brought into the country because uh, patients and families raised money and paid for it themselves. So we've, sh we've seen evidence provided by Anthea that apheresis exchange is a game changer for treatment um, and the avoidance of comorbidities around sickle cell disease but the actual technology and the um, functional elements of it didn't occur without uh, consumer-driven and patient-driven um, you know, uh, impetus. So I'd just like to acknowledge that and thank you to Agnes for introducing a new generation of sickle cell disease awareness. It's so important. Thank you. Thanks very much, Louisa. Um, are there any other questions? Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Kabaso. I'm from the Zambian community. So I know Agnes through that. But also I'm a sufferer of thalassemia minor. Today I'm here on my individual capacity, but I've come with a few colleagues from the RMIT, we're nurse educators. And we're just interested in what you plan, you know, for disseminating this information. Um, Agnes and I have been chatting, and uh, she's got a friend in Zambia um, whose child had a bone marrow transplant, and that just happens to be my sister-in-law. Therefore, the children that had um, the transplant in India, they are cousins to my children. So we are very much interested in how you hope to disseminate this information. And also just to say as Zambians and interested uh, people, we are interested in knowing which areas of research you seek um, so that we can render any help. Thank you very much. So is there anyone from the panel that would like to respond to that? I believe that's 
a question directed more to the ACER as an organisation. Agnes, did you want to respond? Or? No? Okay, so I'll hand it over to Anthea. I think, I think there's a number of strategies. I think it involves sort of lobbying at medical school, nursing school, sort of educational levels to make sure it's in the curriculum. But I think that the first step is actually things like the data and the demographics, because often we have to justify you know, our capacity to educate people about how common the problem this is. So I think all of those things are linked. But I think this sort of organisation and, you know, it, uh, groups of interested clinicians who are able to mobilise support is really important. I think the genetic screening and, and having sort of a, a presence in genetic screening of newborns is also important because that highlights for many clinicians, medical, nursing, other, that that's an important problem that people need to know about when they're coming through as, as trainers. Fantastic. Thanks, Anthea. So, were there any other questions from the audience? Yes? Oh, I'll, I'll start with this one. Sorry, we'll start here. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Mohammed Amosawi, and I've got my son, Hussein Amosawi, who was born um, in Shepparton, Victoria, which is a country town in Victoria. Um, Hussein was diagnosed with sickle cell anemia at birth in Shepparton, and Hussein has been pretty up and down uh, throughout and he's been looked after by Dr. Anthea Greenway who has been fantastic. Um, I just wanted to say that how can we improve the um, knowledge of nurses um, at the hospitals uh, outside of the Royal Children because the nurses have no idea. Every time we go to the emergency department in Shepparton they struggle because they put Hussein in and they think like you know they look at his respiratory system and look at his temperature and if it seems okay they put him as a category one or and then he's just sitting there um, at one time one Hussein was nine months old uh, we were there for nearly six hours at AD and then when Hussein was seen by the doctors he was airlifted to this hospital um, or actually the older hospital the royal children um, before it was turned into here and the nurse came in and apologised because she had no knowledge. Um, she had no idea and she, yeah, very lack of, until today, even Hussein was born at that hospital, they have no idea. Two weeks ago, I rang the hematologist and Anthea answered the phone because we were at ED for nearly four hours and Hussein was not seen and they said he could be there for another four or three hours at least. And when he was seen, he was admitted to hospital and he wasn't released till four days later. <coughs> so obviously he had a problem. I'm just wondering if, yeah, if somehow we can get that knowledge out to the nurses, especially, to let them know that there is a condition that does exist in Australia and it needs to be apprehended or attended to. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing that. So I, I can definitely attest as a board member that one of the key issues we're focusing on is education, awareness and research. And in terms of awareness, um, education and research, that's not just to um, potential patients out there, but also um, trying to create more awareness amongst the medical community who may be exposed to people who have sickle cell disease. So in terms of um, GPs, haematologists or anyone who might come in touch with, with patients and also prenatal screening. So sorry, did Agnes, did you want to add anything to that? Yep. Thank you. Well, one of the things that we, we've discussed as an association is for us to engage with uh, the GPs. So we want to start with the local GPs in Victoria and uh, see how we can engage with them, but also with the clinicians. And we've started, um, it's a, uh, a lot of red tape to, to get through to the hospitals. So that's something that we are trying to focus on and see if we can have contact uh, persons in, in different hospitals. And yes, uh, uh, clinicians' education is one of the things that we've faced over the years as well. But that's something that's top on our list. Thank you very much. So I believe we've got one question waiting up the back there in the audience. Thank you. Uh, good morning all, my name is Shontao, I'm originally from the Democratic Republic of Congo. 
and uh, <laughs> I was just looking at this uh, leaflet and I could see that the statistics from a country where I come from it's quite high with people with uh, sickle cell. I'll start by thanking uh, Agnes and the team and all the doctors who are doing fantastic work. I, um, growing up in the DRC, which is the, the Democratic Republic of Congo, it's like growing up in a home, like in, in a hospital. So I've lost a couple of brothers to sickle cell and um, information is power, knowledge is power. If we had known, even the little bit that I know today, maybe we could have saved some lives. So my question is to the doctor, the doctor who's got a lot of knowledge, I wish I could take you in my home and... <laughs> um, my understanding is that there are different type of sickle cell. They are the, what they call IS and then SS. Can you explain that to me? And also, I, I just want to put a couple of questions here because uh, I can save some time. Um, when somebody's got a, a wound, it, I've seen uh, someone's got a wound, but they're not healing. The wound does not heal because, they, because of the disease. And they've taken a lot of um, uh, muscle from different parts of the body to close that wound, but it, it, it healed and it comes back again. Um, my third question is, why, why is it we're not putting the blood testing of sickle cell at GP when you go and do your blood test, if that could be another component of that? Thank you. Thank you for your questions. So there are different types of sickle cell disease. So there's SS, S, beta and SC are three of the most common, but in a large number. We know that if you have one copy of the sickle cell gene and then you get a second copy that affects any of those different types of haemoglobin, then the, the combination can produce what we know as sickle cell disease collectively. So there are different types. There is a little bit of variation in terms of how that can present in the patient and the different types of complications are related to the haemoglobin that the patient inherits. But that's sort of the basics of it. But all of those three are together. Yeah. Um, wound healing is a problem for patients with sickle cell. It's because of that problem when we can't get the oxygen to the skin to help the wound heal. So that's one of the things that we need to treat and many of those treatments I mentioned can be used to help with wound healing. But it is a problem as we, as we get older. Acting, yeah. So, look, the challenge, so really what we need is neonatal screening, so where we screen babies on day three. Many of you have had children will remember on day three they have a heel prick and we do lots of spots on a little filter card that is then tested for a number of genetic lesions. Certainly when I was a medical student there was a small number of things we tested for. That's been rapidly expanded and I suspect in the next few years with some lobbying from groups such as ASCA and help from our members of parliament, this may well be something that we can get on um, the screening program. It's always a risk benefit analysis from a sort of government point of view in terms of how common is the gene and how likely are we to see that. What I would encourage you to do is if you, if you or family members are aware that there's a history of sickle cell disease or you're from one of the countries I've mentioned where the gene frequency is quite high, that that is mentioned if um, family members are thinking about having their own family because knowing your sickle cell status is really important if you are from one of those countries. The problem we have is that unless you specifically test with a special test called a haemoglobinopathy screen or haemoglobin electrophoresis, for many patients who have just one copy of the gene, who is a carrier, an S carrier, the full blood count that your GP might do for other reasons will not show any signs that you're a carrier. So it has to be specifically tested for and specifically requested by, by um, the GP or the doctor doing it. So that's the sort of challenge and why it's often missed. The last, can I just make one more comment? So just to respond to the comment we had before, what I wanted to say, um, and I haven't done so far, is that it is challenging to get the information to every single person who is you know, obviously trying to care very much for their patients when you meet them in the emergency department or the hospital. For many of our families, you will be the most knowledgeable person about sickle cell. Okay? And so we need your advocacy. We need you to go to that place and say, 
this is the situation, I know a lot about this condition, I really need your help. And, and you know, as a clinician, I always rely on my families and my patients to be an advocate for their child. We need to hear what you need and what the issues are. We may not always be able to respond as immediately as we would like, but th that is usually the intent for most of the interactions that we have. I think that, you know, part of the working with the group will be to make sure we set up networks there is always help available, so patients should always feel as though they can contact their treating centre and the clinicians there can always feed back to some of our rural centres that may have less experience. But I think, you know, don't be afraid to stand up for what you know is what needs to happen and you're all very well educated and you know what sort of needs to happen from there. So make sure and you're the best advocates and the, the medical fraternity and med medicine and nursing, you know, we're, we're, really help, we're really grateful when I have a family say, this is what I know needs to happen from the person who looks after me. So make sure you share that information. It's really important. I was just going to make a follow-up comment about the hemoglobinopathy screening. Um, in the US, as you would know, that is standard practice that all babies have hemoglobinopathy testing. And within the cord blood bank, um, before we can release a cord blood unit, we have to do hemoglobinopathy testing. But the testing is so expensive here in Australia, we will only do it just prior to release, unless uh, unless there's a family history or the region that a donor has come from puts them at a, a slightly higher risk, then we will do the screening. But um, yeah, so it is quite different to what we have here in Australia. And I guess that's traditionally because of the demographics of the population, which clearly is changing in Australia. So. Thank you very much. Look, in the interest of time, we realise everyone's got a busy day ahead and we have promised to close at 9.30. So I'd like you all to um, give a warm round of applause to our panel members. <laughs> and I believe we have some gifts for our panel members. Um, I think Agnes's children are gonna come up and present those. Um, and while they do that, I'd just like to mention um, yes, apologies if we had to cut the panel session short due to time. We uh, really want to address any questions you have, so if you could please um, go onto our website, find our email address, um, sorry, there are LinkedIn social media profiles, please email through any questions you have. Also, I believe some of our panel members will be lingering around after the event, so you're also welcome to um, ask any questions after the event. While we're getting, sorry, some photos taken um, of our expert panel member, um, I'd like to invite our board chairman of ASCA, uh, Joseph, to come up and say a few final words before we close officially. Thank you. Uh, it's been a, an amazing day. Uh, without your presence, your sacrifices uh, and your gifts, we wouldn't have been able to make it true to today. Uh, special thanks to our key sponsors, CSL. Uh, had the opportunity to have a chat with Michael Wilson, the Vice President. We're so grateful for your uh, gifts uh, that's helped us in this regard. Uh, also remembering our speaker, the Honorable Murray, uh, Federal Member of Parliament, for your keynote address. I uh, would also want to appreciate the executive team of the Australian Sickle Cell Advocacy Group. They've been very supportive of the work uh, Agnes has been doing. So if you could uh, please stand up for recognition. Executive Committee, uh, please a round of applause. These individuals have sacrificed months uh, of hard work to put this uh, event together. We're very, very grateful for your support. Uh, the panelists um, seated here, uh, Peter, Claire, um, Robin, uh, Agnes, you didn't sit on, on that, obviously. Uh, Greer and Dr. Luke, who is not here, obviously. Uh, to the University of Melbourne for their support, the Red Cross um, Blood Services. Dr. Antia Greenway, uh, the Zambian High Commissioner 
uh, to Australia, who is ably represented here today by Mr. Morgan. Uh, thank you for your presence also. Dr. Maggie, uh, who has uh, won so many hearts for the association, uh, deep thanks for your support also for the photography and the many things you do, uh, being a coach to Agnes and so many wonderful things you've done for this association. Uh, Dr. Sarah, uh, can we put our hands together? A round of applause for, you know, you know she's been the company for today, doing an amazing job. Uh, and to everyone that has supported us in one form or the other for coming out here uh, in the cold of winter and also for participating in uh, a very dynamic uh, group this has been, for your insightful uh, questions and views and perspectives. Let's keep the conversation going. Uh, and I believe that uh, the sky is even the starting point. A uh, round of applause to Agnes. Uh, Agnes, can you stand up once again? Uh, you know, it's so much she had to go through uh, from the family front, but even getting the association to uh, move forward from the corporate governance, getting the board together. Uh, I also want to appreciate the board members. If you stand up uh, for recognition. Uh, yeah, so they put their reputation, uh, put their time together to make sure today is a success. So without so much uh, ado, thank you again and wish you a great day.